Hello and welcome everyone to this MSSO webinar, Standardized Medra Queries. My name is Suzanne Insur Shaker or Shaker, both pronunciations are correct, and I'll be your instructor for this webinar. I'm joined by my colleague, Hannah Eaton, who is an MSSO training coordinator. So I'd like to start with some introductions and go over some housekeeping items before we get started. I'm a medical officer with the Medra MSSO team, having joined the team late last year after about 20 years or so in the industry um, with different pharma and CRO teams within various functional groups, including data management, medical coding, medical monitoring, pharmacovigilance, medical device safety, and medical data science. I'm based in New Jersey on the East Coast of the United States. And although this webinar is not heavy on polls like our coding offerings tend to be, I'd still very much like to get to know you a little better. And it helps us test out the polls as well with, with you answering a few short questions. So where you're calling from uh, and your background. You can access the uh, poll account directly through the link shown on your screen or through the QR code. It is anonymized. So if it asks for any username, just use Medra123. And with that, we can get started with the first poll. If you could just uh, show your location. Thank you so much. I see responses starting to come in. And as we wait for responses, let me go over some housekeeping items. So this webinar is scheduled for two hours. We do have an ambitious agenda, to be honest. There's a lot of information available, and I'm hope hopeful that it's um, helpful to you to answer some questions uh, some folks might be dealing with. So, for example, if you've received a question from one of your team members or one of your stakeholders um, saying something like, a monitor calls you, he notices that there are um, a few subjects in the same site now with increase in certain lab uh, functions, like, for example, lactic acid. And they want to know if you have similar cases coming in or adverse events related to these terms. Can you pull them up for me? Can you retrieve those case IDs so I can take a look? Or maybe you faced uh, a different kind of question. Maybe you're working on a brand new product and the team wants to check and see if we're seeing any alarming signals or uh, aggregates of uh, similar side effects and problems as those faced by comparable products in the same class that are used for the same indication. So if you run into these kind of questions, um, hopefully, you'll come away from this webinar with a solid idea on how to approach them. I'm so glad to see many of you from different parts of the world. It's truly a global region when you think about human safety and medicinal products and a testament to the widespread use of and application of Medra on a global scale. So thank you for joining us. If it's early for you or late for you, we do appreciate you taking the time. The uh, next poll asks about the roles and functions you perform. So you can click as many as are applicable to you in, in your uh, current organization or even in previous organizations. Um, a few more housekeeping items as the responses are coming in. So Hannah will be kindly facilitating our session today. If you're having any issues with Paul EV or if you're connection uh, ha is having issues, please do let her know in the chat feature and she'll try to help you. And if you have questions as we go through the slides, please feel free to post them there. Hannah will be monitoring the chat feature and she'll bring the, bring me um, the questions as they come along. We have a large selection from the uh, TV part of the industry, so welcome. We do have medical reviewers. We have folks who are hands-on coders, um, data analysts, folks working with medical writing or regulatory affairs, a few from the IT and bias staff. So this is really wonderful. Uh, I think it's a, a great testament to show the involvement of Medra in so many different functionalities. And if I'd like to, to have one uh, takeaway from this webinar is that Medra and all its tools are available to you to be leveraged in your day-to-day um, uh, -day activities and in your functionalities and in your groups across so many different applications. And I think Medra is best maximized when it's used across different functionalities and different groups. So let me take you to the next one. The next one just asks you about how experienced are you 
with Medra. You don't have to be a coder to uh, utilize the SMQ analysis tools, uh, and you don't have to be uh, very familiar with, uh, with Medra. All right, so we do have a, um, a nice cross-functional uh, representation of folks with different experiences in Medra. I'm glad to see that the majority have some familiarity with Medra because this webinar does assume that you have some familiarity with Medra. And um, for those who have very limited knowledge of Medra, we do offer other webinars that have more details on the structure of Medra, the uses of Medra, what Medra is, uh, how it is built, and um, the hierarchies within Medra. So unfortunately, we can't go over too many details in this webinar because we do want to focus on the SMQs, but you, you are more, well, more than welcome to um, reference our medra.org website. There is a calendar on the top right-hand corner. It shows you all the offerings uh, coming your way in different languages as well that you can select the ones that you prefer. All right. so. My last question before we get started is, have you previously attended the webinar, Data Analysis and Query Building with Medra? And it seems to be kind of a cross note, more folks have attended, that's wonderful. Yes, because um, just to show you, just to show you our training curriculum. So this is our roadway to knowing Medra and it starts from very basic webinars of getting starting getting started with Medra all the way through the basics of Medra the structure and scope through coding both basic and advanced and culminating with the, the purple box of uh, query analysis uh, uh, mean data analysis query building with Medra and the SMQs so it is more helpful to you if you had previously attended the uh, data analysis and query, query building with Medra, you don't have to have attended it, but it's more helpful to you because we won't be touching on the same topics we went into um, in detail in that webinar. It is available to you on our YouTube channel, and we're always offering it as webinars if you want to ask questions during the live presentations. Okay, so let me go back to my slideshow and get started. This is our introductory slide. This is a slide that is shared on all of our webinars, but I do like to stop here for a few minutes every time I give a presentation because my own thinking is that to understand Medra and how to use Medra, you you'd really need to understand why Medra was created and what it was intended to do. So Medra was created by the ICH and it is still owned by the ICH and the origins of Medra um, go back to the same origins of the ICH. In fact, if you look at our website on the top right-hand corner, there's a logo there for ICH that links you to the ICH uh, website. And on their website, they have a very nice outline in their history talking about the development of the ICH and how the ICH was born. And it mentions how different areas of the world and different regions of the world arrived at different timelines to the understanding or the realization that there needs to be oversight for medicinal products used in humans before they hit the market. And sadly, that realization often came at the heels of a tragedy. So. Europe had it, the tragedy of thalidomide, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with in the 50s and 60s. That sad story with all those um, congenital deformities and, and those babies and uh, the fact that these pregnant women were taking a very dangerous medication, thinking it was safe and taking it just to help them with their morning sickness, had so many layers of failure that it prompted a rash of um, rules and regulations in the 60s and 70s to address those those failures. But that led to a complication where the manufacturers found themselves having to struggle meeting all these different requirements, sometimes being divergent requirements. The costs went up, uh, the availability of new products in different uh, markets went down, and that was a no-win situation. So in the 80s, there was a um, successful pioneering effort by Europe 
to standardize requirements in the uh, European markets. And that was soon joined by the US and Japan. So those three regions joined together for harmonization. And that was the birth of ICH at a meeting in Brussels in 1990 as a conference, which later became an ICH as a council with representatives from the regulatory agencies and uh, industry associations from those three regions. And just to show you what, what I just talked about, this here on the top right-hand corner is the logo for the ICH. So if you click it, it takes you to the ICH website. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with the ICH guidelines. So you have the guidelines for quality, safety, um, efficacy guidelines, the, GC, the GCP guidelines uh, for E6, the E2 guidelines for pharmacovigilance, and many of these guidelines, if you actually click on the guideline and just if you look up MEDRA, you're going to see its references, uh, not only where to use MEDRA, for example, line listings and summary tabulations, but also which level of MEDRA should be used in these guidelines. So another example is um, the PBR, for example, the E2C guideline. And again, if you look up MEDRA, you'll see that it's mentioned here, referenced not just for the preferred term, but also for the system organ class. So I thought this was um, helpful. So going back to our slide, it becomes easier to see now that MEDRA was developed under the auspices of the ICH because one of the most important things they realized early on is that if harmonization was to be successful, they had to be able to easily communicate not only with each other, but they had to be able to compare data across different regions, across different indications, across different product types, and also across time. And that was the idea behind the birth of MEDRA. So a working group was created, a standard was decided upon to get started, and it was based off of an existing terminology at that time, in use by what later became known as the MHRA. And that's why we see that the fur terms and higher levels in MEDRA have proper English spelling, what you sometimes call the British spelling. All right, so um, the role of my team, the MSSO team, we do not own MEDRA, but we are the repository for MEDRA. We maintain it, we develop it, and we distribute it. But all our functions is overseen by the owner of MEDRA, by ICH, through the um, management committee, which is composed of the six ICH parties, uh, the MHRA of the UK, Health Canada, and the WHO as observer. Our next slide is our disclaimer and copyright slide, basically saying that just like MEDRA is owned by the ICH, these slides are owned and copyrighted to the ICH, but they will give you permission to use them without the, uh, of course, the logos, the ICH or the MEDRA logos, as long as you don't make changes. If you do need to make changes, you do need to acknowledge the changes and you need to avoid any inference that these changes you made are in any way endorsed by the ICH. The second bullet point is legal verbiage, basically saying that the presentation is provided as is without warranty. And the third bullet point basically means that if we use any third party material, then that third party material would be excluded from the above mentioned copyright permissions. And you will need to reach out to the third party themselves for permission to use their slides. So what we'll go over today uh, in our course is a review of a guideline that is ICH endorsed uh, and it's intended for data retrieval and presentation and is called a points to consider document. Coders on, on the line today are familiar perhaps with a uh, term selection points to consider document, which is used for coding. This one is specific for data retrieval and presentation, but it's also ICH endorsed. We'll discuss the features of SMQs, like their backgrounds and characteristics, the impact that MEDRA versioning has on SMQs, some of their benefits and limitations, We'll also uh, demonstrate the SMQ analysis tool. So I'd like to spend some time doing that demo uh, within our browser. And like I said, you are welcome to try it on your end. Um, we do provide you with temporary credentials in the chat feature. Those credentials are good for accessing the browser and all of our um, Medra tools through the end of this week. Um, if you want to test it after that, you'll need to use your own uh, um, 
company's Mudra username and password, or you can use them from now. And if you're not sure what those are, you can retrieve them through our uh, self-service application. So on our uh, homepage, on the top right, right hand corner, the SSA link will walk you through how to retrieve your username and password. We'll also uh, show you during this webinar some of the SMQ applications where they're used. We'll give you examples of uh, two scenarios in real life that demonstrate the use of SMQs. We'll touch very briefly on the creation of customized searches, but we won't go into detail because that is one of the topics that is covered in detail in the other webinar, the uh, data analysis and uh, uh, query building with webinar, with Medra webinar, and we'll conclude with questions and answers. So like I said, it is an ambitious agenda, but hopefully we'll get through all of it. So. The PTC document, let me show you first where to get it. So I'm going to take you back. Let me close off these documents and I'm going to go back to our home page and I'll show you up again on the right hand uh, corner. There's very helpful quick links here for you. So there's our SSA self-service application for retrieving your passwords. There's our WBB, our web-based browser link. We'll go into that hopefully in a little bit down uh, along this um, webinar for a demo on the WBB, a brief demo. And here's a link for PTC. So points to consider. If you click on points to consider link, it will default to the blue ribbon, expand and open. And it's the same area that you would access had you chosen the how to use button and selected support documentation. So either one will take you to the same location. Um, and it's, the blue ribbon is the one that includes uh, the ICH endorsed guidelines. So there's the one for term selection, points to consider. This is the one that is the guideline used for coding with Medra. And it's called term selection because basically when you're coding with Medra, what you are doing is selecting one of the terms that already exists in Medra at the lowest level term at the LLT that is the closest possible match to your original verbatim, so to your natural language term. And that's why it's called a term selection, points to consider. It has a companion document at the bottom here for areas that have um, a lot of interest, such as medication errors. So it has a lot of details uh, uh, in the companion document, and they're both great references for coding. The focus for our webinar today is the data retrieval and presentation points to consider documents. But I wanna show you also that the same location offers you this um, additional document, the Medra Best Practices. And the Medra Best Practices is a great reference if you're pondering your options for versioning with Medra. Uh, what, what will be your approach for uh, handling the new Medra releases that come out every six months. It has a lot of details on your options from option one to option six for your clinical data. The gray ribbons are release specific. So the gray ribbons are updated with every single release of Medra and they include the MSSO prepared documents for introductory guide, very useful for coding. The introductory guide for SMQs is a really large detailed document that goes into the detail of how each of the SMQs is defined, uh, its inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, some notes on running it. So if there are any specific SMQs that you're interested in, and just to give you an example, so here are the um, individual SMQs. If you are interested in a particularly specific SMQ, this will give you the details of how it's defined, its inclusion and exclusion criteria. It's a very large document, so um, it's intended to be used with uh, specific SMQs in mind. And of course, the same section offers you the what's new Metro version, which gives you the um, a very short idea, uh, very targeted idea about what changed between the versions. So going back to our PTC document, if you click it open and it's available to you in multiple formats, as well as a red line version compared to last release. And if you click it open right there on the um, front page, you'll see that it is in fact an ICH endorsed guide, which is why we're gonna spend a bit of time going through a few of the details that it offers. So the intention of this document 
are exactly what it says. It points to consider, points to think about. They are options for the industry and for the regulatory purposes. It is most effective when it's used in combination with the other ICH endorsed guidelines for term selection as well as the companion documents. And it is highly recommended that every organization develop their own individual organization's approach to data retrieval conventions because we can't possibly standardize um, for every single need. So we give you the options on how to do it and we recommend that you create your own conventions as long as they are aligned with the ICH endorsed PTC document. So the PTC document is developed by a working group of the ICH Management Committee, and all the PTC documents are updated annually uh, every March, and they are available in um, six full translations for English, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, and Russian, but we also have started offering them in condensed versions in other Medra languages that you see on the box on the slide, and they're available on the Medra website and the JMO website. So JMO stands for uh, Japanese Maintenance Organization because like we said, when ICH was created, it was created in three different regions of the world, Europe, Japan, and the US. So when Medra was born, Medra was born as a twin, in English and Japanese, the MSSO maintains the English and the other translations of Medra, and the JMO sister organization maintains the Japanese Medra. When you go through the PTC document, and I do advise you to go through the PTC document, it's not a very large document. It has a lot of information that you'll find helpful to you, especially if you're trying to answer questions from other team members and you're not sure uh, how to approach those questions, look up um, the PTC document. It has a lot of helpful information in it. So it offers you general principles, for example, on quality of source data. And when we talk about quality of source data, we're talking about two types of source data. So you have the quality of the information that is originally reported, so your verbatim or your natural language terms. It has to be, of course, the better quality of your input the better quality of your output, but also the quality of how well you maintained that source data through your coding process. So that's another source data. Also the importance of uh, documentation of your practices. So the um, benefits of having the, the, the documents available is not only that you are showing what you do, you are uh, documenting your strategies and your approaches, but you're um, reproducing these strategies and these approaches, no matter what happens to your individual team members. You're able to answer questions if you receive any questions from audits, you're able to train new team members, or you're able to ensure continuity of knowledge when existing team members leave. And examples of things that you should be documenting, of course, are the Medra versions you're using for your coding, for your searching, uh, what your approach is uh, for the version updates for every Medra release every six months. What are your um, strategy methods and are they detailed enough to be reproducible no matter what changes you have in your team members? And what are your processes for creating and maintaining customized Medra queries, which is not going to be the, the focus of this topic, but it has information in the PTC document about that, as well as QA procedures. Are you documenting them? So do not alter Medra is a very important principle, one of the most important principles in any of our webinars, because Medra is a standardized terminology. It has a predefined hierarchy that should not be altered. So you must not make any ad hoc structural alterations to Medra, even if you're able to. Please do not change the primary system organ class allocation. If you do so, you're really compromising the integrity of Medra as a standard. And this standard is used by all Medra subscribers, including any sister organizations or partner organizations you're working with, and including any regulatory bodies that you're interacting with. But if you do see any terms in Medra that you think are not placed in the best location or in the best hierarchy, then you can help us make it better by submitting a change request to the MSSO. 
Um, another principle addressed in the PTC document is knowing your organization specific data characteristics. So even though MEDRA is a standard, it is not used the same in every different organization. So some organizations may have implemented MEDRA at um, different levels than other organizations. So you need to know in your own specific organization, what is your database structure for MEDRA? What is the MEDRA hierarchy that is stored? Are you uh, storing the HLTs and HLGTs or just the LLTs and PTs? Are you um, using synonyms, uh, synonym lists? And if so, are they global? Or, or not? Um, are you uh, uh, implementing data conversion from other terminologies, uh, like um, uh, like a, a CoStart, for example? Uh, does your uh, database uh, configuration allow output and view by secondary um, hierarchy, or is it just the primary hierarchy? Uh, does your organization have a one-to-one -one correlation of verbatim to Medra code, or do you allow uh, assigning more than one code per verbatim? So always consider your own organization approach to data characteristic, but also it's important to know if you're working with another organization, are they following the same approach as you or not? Because um, if not, then there may be a bit of confusion down the line when you're doing analysis. Um, another thing to be uh, aware of are characteristics of MEDRA that impact data retrieval and analysis. And um, examples of that is like grouping terms in the higher grouping levels in MEDRA, like the HLT and the HLGT levels, as well as principles for MEDRA versioning, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, our focus today will not um, uh, go into detail about general queries and retrieval, nor about customized searches, because those topics are covered in more detail in the data analysis and query building with Medra webinar. So if those topics are of interest to you, please do refer to those webinars, either as offered um, on our YouTube channel, or you can sign up and attend live ones. So let's talk about Medra versioning. So Medra is released twice a year. We have the complex release in March where the um, changes can happen in all levels of MEDRA. We have the simple release in September, and that's the point one release, where the change is possible only at the LLT and PT levels. And whatever version that you use in your data retrieval and presentation should be documented and should be the same version as the one used in coding. If you don't match the versions between the version you use for coding your data and the version you're using for looking at your data, you're going to miss some data. And of course, we provide you resources like that. What's new document? I showed you that's what's new document in those gray ribbons with every release that tells you what changed between the different versions. We also provide you with every release an Excel version report that gives you very detailed uh, output of the exact terms that changed on all the different levels of Medra that is provided to you with every release packet. And we also provide you with our MVAT tool. So I'll give you a little bit of information about the MVAT tool, but not too many details. Again, the MVAT tool is one of those topics covered in the other webinar for um, data analysis and query building. So um, this is the URL available to you for the MVAT tool. It is available to you as a subscriber. You use your um, a subscription uh, password and um, user ID to access it. It's free to all users, and it has three main features. It allows you to generate a version report comparing any two Medra versions. They don't have to be consecutive Medra versions and to export that as an Excel sheet. It allows you to input your own data that you coded in Medra and identify what the new versions of Medra will have on your data. So you can do a data impact report by inputting your own Medra coded data. Uh, and it allows you to do an individual term search. So you can look up one single term and identify the changes that happen to that term throughout its life cycle within Medra. And the Medra, the MVAT tool itself also allows you to change the user interface language and the um, report outputs in all the supported Medra languages. It also allows you to run the reports on supplemental changes. Supplemental changes are changes that have been reviewed and approved for release but have not yet been released. So um, the MVAT actually allows you to 
prepare yourself for the next coming version of Medra that hasn't yet been released and identify from now how that's going to impact your data. And of course, it's, you also have the option to run it on secondary system organ class changes. So if you're interested in uh, the MVAT tool and more details about the MVAT tool, there is a very um, well-prepared webinar in, in two sections in the um, link shown to you on the screen. And of course, these slides themselves are available to you. So if you go back to the same location you uh, registered in for this webinar, you'll see a copy of the PDF for those slides and you can um, access the uh, that uh, two-part webinar. All right, so this is the the, the, the meat of the, the, the presentation today. It's about uh, SMQs. So before we get started, just a few a few questions. And I hope that you're able to access the uh, this slide, this poll, and um, provide your response. So let me just check if I'm seeing responses. Okay, so data coding is usually performed at which MEDRA level? All right, so MEDRA is a five-tier hierarchy. It has five levels in its hierarchy. The lowest level term, the LLT level, is the one that has the most uh, in number. It has the most in number, the LLT level. And I want to make sure that I, I make this clear for you because uh, I have answers all over all over the place. Um, the LLT level, the lowest level term, is the one that is designed. Um, the reason why there's so many of them is the one that is designed to be able to closely mimic that original verbatim to the extent possible. So when you interact with Medra, basically what you're doing is you're selecting a low level term in Medra that is the closest possible to your verbatim. That is how you code in Medra. So the correct answer here would be the LLT. So when you're coding in Medra, when you access Medra, you are trying to find an LLT, a low level term in Medra that is the closest possible match to the original verbatim that you've received. My second question is, Data analysis is usually performed at which MEDRA level? So this question is when you're analyzing data in MEDRA, what is the one that is typically used for data analysis in MEDRA? So let's take a look at responses. Yes, I'm glad to see the responses here are correct. So the preferred term is the one typically used for analysis and presentation. In, in MEDRA. So the preferred term is not as numerous in MEDRA as the LLT. And um, just as an, a, a quick overview of the structure of MEDRA, remember we said the LLTs are meant to match to the extent possible your verbatim as you received it. But different LLTs can mean the same thing. So for example, if, you, if you're uh, talking about upper abdominal pain, somebody might say upper abdominal pain or abdominal pain upper, or they might say uh, stomach ache, or some might say gastralgia. They all mean the same thing. So these LLTs are sibling terms that mean the same thing. And that same thing is a unique individual concept, which is a preferred term. And that's where um, most companies will, will use that level when they are presenting their data and when they are analyzing their data. Higher level groups can also be used for analyzing data. So the HLT, the HLGT, the system organ class, they can also be used for data analysis. And for more details on that, I do refer you to, to our um, other webinar, Data Analysis and Query Building with Medra. But I'm so glad to see the, the responses on this slide. Um, and uh, before we go into the SMQs, just approximately how many level one SMQs do you think we currently have? in Madra. It doesn't have to be a correct answer. This is just an approximate. So I'll give you a few uh, few minutes just to pick one. Uh, if you don't know, it's fine. Just just pick whatever you think is, is the right answer. And let's take a look. So again, all over the place. All right, so I'm not going to be giving you the right response now because the right response is coming down, but please bear this slide in mind as we progress through the the, um, the slides because the, the responses are all over the place, right? Okay, let's, let's get to it. 
what is a query? So when you think about standardized Medra queries, so what is the definition of a query? Basically for, um, for finding uh, subjects that are of interest to you, you need to have some kind of standard to look against your data. That's a query. So a query is a grouping of Medra preferred terms that are related to a, an area of interest which will the the intent of it is really to help you identify and retrieve um, either subjects or ICSRs individual case safety reports of interest to you and share them with your uh, medical review team so these groupings of preferred terms they include the their subordinates LLT. So just like we said, uh, abdominal pain upper will have uh, stomach ache and gastralgia within it. Those are the subordinate LLTs in that PT, but the PT that is used for the query is the one that represents that, that group of sibling LLTs. Um, the, uh, when you're running an SMQ, you can run it at whatever level of data you have. So if your data exists at the PT level, the SMQ will work. If your data exists at the LLT level, the SMQ will also work. So it, it doesn't really um, hinder you from running the SMQ. These related PTs, so um, before I move on to the next slide, when you run these related PTs against your data, it will come up with hits. So hits meaning it identified subjects in your data database who have terms coded to either an LLT or a PT that was included in the query that you selected to run. And I know it sounds a little bit, a little bit uh, uh, confusing. So going back, for example, to that question that we, we talked about in the beginning, your monitor calls you up and he said, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of um, subjects in one site and I'm seeing this lab result keep coming back as elevated. Do we have anything in our database that shows a signal and can you send me those case IDs? Well, you need to identify what are the PTs and the LLTs that answer his question. Do we have PTs and LLTs for lactic acid increased? And do we have PTs or LLTs for medical conditions related to um, lactic acid increase? that I can include in my query. Once you have that list of PTs and LLTs, you're gonna run them against your own data. And any hits that are identified will tell you, here's a subject with an LLT or PT that matches your query. And then you can retrieve the case IDs and share them with your team members. So standardized metro queries are really a grouping of uh, preferred terms that are related to each other, and they don't have to come from the same system organ class. So if you're familiar with, with uh, coding in Medra, you do know that preferred terms can be linked to more than one system organ class. So for example, a congenital heart disease, you'd find that in your congenital system organ class and you're gonna find that in your cardiac system organ class as well. The predefined structure of Medra determines where that primary link exists and which of these is going to be the secondary link. But in your SMQs, it doesn't matter whether it's in one or more system organ classes. It doesn't matter if the link is primary or secondary. The SMQs are designed to group together preferred terms that represent one area of interest from a clinician's perspective or a medical perspective. And these preferred terms can either be as straightforward as the diagnosis itself or the name of the syndrome, or a sign, or a symptom, or a physical finding related to that area of interest, or a lab result, or an intervention, or a procedure that may have been highly indicative that something was done to treat this area of interest. And the whole intention of it is to retrieve cases of interest that you can share with your medical team. So now we come to the answer of our poll. How many level one SMQs exist uh, currently in Medra? And the answer is 110. So we have 110 level one SMQs in production as of version 26. And when I say level one, maybe some of you will ask, does that mean there's a level two and three and yes, a four, yes, and a five, yes, but no more than that. So why do we have levels two and three and four and five? Because when you look at some of these types of SMQs, like for, for example, hepatic disorders, it's such a wide concept. 
that grouping everything possibly related to a hepatic disorder in one SMQ makes it unmanageable. It would be so large. So we break them down into smaller groups. So this SMQ for hepatic disorder has sub SMQs that belong to it because it can tell you, well, are you interested in congenital hepatic disorders? Are you interested in drug related hepatic disorders? Or maybe you're interested in alcohol related hepatic disorders, or maybe you're interested in infection-related hepatic disorders, or maybe even pregnancy-related. So we have sub-SMQs that belong under hepatic disorders so that when you are retrieving cases of interest, you don't have to pull up every single case of a hepatic disorder and uh, um, that may or may not be of interest to you. And even those level two SMQs sometimes are so large that they are also broken down into smaller SMQs, again, to be more manageable. But when you decide to run your SMQ analysis, you can decide to run it on everything or just any one of those uh, subordinate uh, SMQs. So just looking over um, this, this whole uh, outline of the 110 level one SMQs, the, uh, the best description that I've heard someone provide in, in one of our webinars is that these are all bad things. They're all bad. You don't want to have subjects uh, um, suffering these things that may be related to your product. And that's the whole intention of the SMQs, is to find these bad signals, these alarming signals. So when you look through them, um, anaphylactic reaction, convulsions, COVID-19, uh, depression or, or uh, suicide ideations, hypersensitivity, even lack of efficacy, it's not working. Um, if you develop pregnancy while you're using your product, I think you'd want to know if someone got pregnant using your, your product. So they're, they're all things that are alarming to you. And the, when, when we go through the slides, I'll, I'll walk you through my own uh, um, thinking of MEDRA and the MEDRA SMQs to make it a little bit easier. But let's get started a little bit with the data characteristics. So as we go through the next slides, these are the details that we're going to delve a little bit more deeper into. So the first one, MEDRA term inclusion. So we said that the SMQs are constructed or are built at the preferred term level. Every preferred term that has subordinate LLTs, meaning that the SMQ will be able to tell you to hit one of your uh, uh, data, um, uh, data uh, points, whether that data is coded at the LLT or the PT level. So it, it will hit it. And just as, as a, a quick overview of our hierarchy, these are the five levels of our MEDRA hierarchy. The most numerous ones are the ones at the LLT level at the bottom of the screen. There's about 87,000 as of uh, MEDRA version 26. And we said how similar LLTs get grouped together under one preferred term, which represent that unique concept. So you'll see how the numbers drastically shrink from 87,000 to about 26,000 at the PT level. And every LLT can only be linked to one preferred term. So we cannot link the same LLT to more than one preferred term. But once you hit the preferred term level, then you can link it to more than one system organ class. Like we said, that example with the congenital heart disease, it can be congenital uh, disorders if you're interested in that. It can be cardiac disorders, you can find it under that. But who decides the primary linkage is predefined within MEDRA. PTs that are similar to each other from a, uh, a clinical perspective or a medical perspective are linked together in HLT groups. And again, the numbers shrink. And then HLTs or high level terms that are related to each other, again, from a medical perspective are linked together in high level group terms, HLGTs. And again, the numbers shrink and those in turn um, get grouped in the uh, appropriate system organ class and there's only 27 of those. So this gives you an idea on how the signals coming into MEDRA get amplified and aggregated as you go from the LLT level all the way to the system organ class. But the, um, the one thing that I think about when, when I'm looking at an SMQ is that, yes, the SMQs are designed to pick out things that are bad, and each SMQ has a collection of preferred terms in it, but not every preferred term will be as alarming as everybody else. 
So, so for example, let's say you're interested in cardiac failure and uh, you're worried that your product may be related to um, development of cardiac failure in subjects who take your product. So you're really keen on identifying whether or not you have cardiac failure in your database. If you have a preferred term that says cardiac failure and one of your adverse events is coded to, a, to that preferred term of cardiac failure, that's a very alarming signal. But if you have one of your subjects with a, an adverse event that was coded as a cardiac dysfunction, or maybe one of your subjects had a, um, an adverse event that was coded to edema peripheral, then is that also an alarming signal? Or could those have come from something else other than cardiac failure? So what the SMQs do is they retrieve all the terms that are important enough to be looked at. It's, it's seeking out everything that's bad um, the way that I think about it is seeking out heat signals. So it's looking up for things that are burning. And everything that's burning can be red, but flames that burn blue are the hottest. So everything that is blue in your SMQ, that's the hottest flame. That's the one that is most specific to the area of interest that you're looking for. And that, those are your narrow terms. So when you look up our, our uh, uh, color code uh, in our SMQ, and hopefully when we get to the um, demos, I'll be showing you the narrow versus broad in uh, the web-based browser. Anything that you see in blue is still a hot signal, and it's the most uh, in terms of, of hottest signals because the blue flame burns hotter. So if you see narrow terms that are blue in your SMQ, those are the most specific. Those are the most targeted to say, yes, these are very highly uh, likely to be of interest to your medical team. The ones that are in red are still bad, but we're not 100% sure that they can be um, highly relevant to your area of interest. So we're calling them broad. So when you run a narrow search in the SMQ analysis tool, you're only retrieving the blue signals hottest of the flames and when you're running a broad search you don't want to ignore the blue signals they're still hot but you're also joining them with the red ones with the red terms so when you're running a broad search you're including both narrow and broad i hope that's that's kind of um clarifies the slide because i think this is one of the areas we get a lot of questions about so before i continue hannah do we have questions so far we have not received any questions yet. Okay. All right, so let's show an example of what narrow versus broad looks like for lactic acidosis. Anytime you access one of our SMQs uh, in our uh, web-based browser, you're gonna see a, a short description of what that definition of that SMQ uh, is, how it was created, and a few notes on it. Now, remember that introductory guide that I showed you, which I said it's very large documents, it's um, um, available to you with every release. It has all these details in it and more. It has inclusion and exclusion criteria as well. But when you look at it in, um, uh, in the web-based browser, you're gonna see the narrow search terms in blue. And for this particular example, for lactic acidosis, there's only three of them. So it's, a, it's intended to be a more focused output when you're looking only at narrow search terms because anybody with lactic acidosis will meet the criteria of interest for this particular topic. Anybody with hyper, hyperlactidemia will also meet the criteria and anybody with an increased blood lactic acid will meet that criteria. But if you have somebody who presented with a pCO2 abnormal, then they may or may not meet the criteria that your medical team is interested in, but it's worth pulling them and having the medical team review that case and making that decision. Okay, so sometimes you have so many broad uh, terms related to a, a single condition that it becomes so hard to pick through them and it becomes almost um, challenging to eliminate any, any cases because there's so many broad terms among them. And that's where the algorithms come in handy. So if you have way too many signals that are maybe lukewarm and you're not sure what to do with them, 
And so, for example, you're interested in the area of acute pancreatitis, and you want to, to uh, retrieve cases of interest for your medical team about acute pancreatitis, and you start thinking about abdominal pain. So if the subject has abdominal pain, do I want to pull every single subject on my study that has abdominal pain and send them to my medical team? Maybe I do. Maybe, maybe that's too broad a signal. Maybe that's just too lukewarm, and I'm not 100% sure. But what if that same subject who had abdominal pain also had an adverse event of increased amylase? Then would the medical team be more interested in that case? Chances are yes, and that's where the algorithms come in. So the algorithms are meant to take all of those factors in hand and um, looking at your uh, database with the focus on uh, subject-specific output. The same subject may have had multiple broad terms. They all happen on the same subject, and that's, those are the subjects that it's retrieving. So one thing to know about the algorithmic SMQs, you do need to provide your case ID or subject identifier to run algorithmic SMQs. There's not that many of them, there's only 10. So out of the 110 level one SMQs, only 10 have built in algorithms. And another point that I do want to bring up to you is that algorithmic SMQs will not take into um, account any temporal connections uh, when they're retrieving data. So your subject that you're interested in because they had abdominal pain and they also had uh, an increased amylase adverse events may not have had those two events concurrently or within a close enough temporal relationship to make them significant. The algorithmic SMQs will identify for you, here's a subject who had these two broad signals together, but it's up to you to decide how to look at those cases and decide which are the relevant ones and which are not relevant if the temporal association is not there. So let's give an example of an algorithmic SMQ output. So anaphylactic reaction has narrow search terms. Like we said, blue is the hottest flame. So anything under blue is very, very, very relevant to your search when you're looking for an anaphylactic reaction. So things like shock, or anaphylactic shock or anaphylactic transfusion reaction, all of those are very uh, relevant to you when you're looking for anaphylactic reactions. But what about the subject that only has erythema or the subject that only has a decrease in blood pressure? Are you pulling those subjects in as subjects who are identified with anaphylactic reaction possibility or not? So if you apply the algorithmic SMQ search, what the output will tell you is here are all your blue flame, your narrow search terms, but it will also tell you, oh, I found subjects who have either um, asthma plus angioedema, so anything from category B plus anything from category C, or one of these two plus a, a change that may be significant in their blood pressure. So the algorithmic SMQ has a predefined algorithm, and it is also provided to you in our uh, uh, source documents. So the WBB will tell you what the algorithm is, and the introductory guide will tell you what the algorithm is. So when you're thinking through your algorithmic SMQs, basically you're, you're taking it one step at a time. Anything with a, uh, an a level, which is the narrow search terms, I want to retrieve them. Those are my blue flame terms. Those are the hottest of the hot. I want to retrieve them. But when I come to when it comes to the red ones, some of them are lukewarm and some of them are more significant. I want to see them in combinations. So if I see a, a term from group B and it also has the same subject, a term from group C, yes, I want to pull that case. But if that one does not have another one, another a second term that I'm not interested in that case. And the algorithm will do that for you. The hierarchical SMQs are the ones we said are too large to be contained in just one group, kind of like that hepatic disorder. So the hierarchical SMQs basically are SMQs that have smaller groups 
of um, subsumed SMQs within them. And it's up to you to decide which of these smaller groups you're interested in, or if you really want to run the whole hierarchy of that SMQ, it's up to you to decide. The hierarchy in this particular sense is not related to the standard Medra terminology hierarchy. It's just subgroupings of, of SMQs. Uh, here's an example. So if you think that maybe your product may be implicated in leading to cytopenias, are you interested in one particular kind of cell type, like red blood cells or white blood cells or platelets? If so, you're able to run a subordinate SMQs that focuses on that particular cell type. If you're not sure and you want to run it on the entire available cytopenia SMQs, you can run it under the hematopoietic cytopenias and get all of them. Okay, so every SMQ has a status, whether active or inactive. To date in Madra, there's only been one SMQ, which was the pregnancy SMQ. It was replaced by pregnancy and neonatal SMQ. So the standalone pregnancy SMQ was made inactive. And the, um, the status of the terms within the SMQ can be active or inactive, similar to how we have status of um, current versus non-current LLTs when we're doing our coding. The SMQs may have terms that are no longer active and they will have the status of inactive, but we never take them out of the SMQ. So they remain in the SMQ, but they're no longer active. And the reason we keep them is so that you can go back and reference them if you ever had data coded to that SMQ in older versions when that term was active. So you won't ever lose the ability to trace it back. And that's why it remains in there. We already mentioned the importance of running your SMQ analysis using the same version of Medra that you are coding to. Because if you, for example, code Medra to a different uh, version than the version that you're using in your SMQ analysis, you're either running the risk of missing data that's already there or not looking for data that you've already coded to. So it's very important to match the version of the SMQ to the version of the data that was coded. And Here's an, an example, right? So um, this preferred term, hormone receptor positive breast cancer. This preferred term was added in version 23 and it was added to the SMQ uh, under version 23. If your data keeps getting uh, upversioned, so your newer data will have that preferred term in it uh, as applicable, if you have, of course, data that matches that received from your uh, reporters, then you're coding to that preferred term. But when you're pulling your data and analyzing them, if you use a version of the SMQ that's 22.1, that SMQ is not even looking for that preferred term. So you're not going to pick any of them up. You're not going to hit on them because it's not in your SMQ. And conversely, if you're using a newer version of the SMQ, but your data happen to be coded in older versions of uh, Medra, you're looking for something that's not there because it hasn't been coded to that preferred term. SMQs can be really, really very helpful. SMQs are concept driven. So no matter what your therapeutic area is, you can apply them across multiple therapeutic areas. You can use them to compare your product to comparative products because they're standardized, right? You can use them to compare your product across time. They are validated, meaning that they have been tested out um, during the, their build process and their build process is very complex because they do get tested out by um, experts in those relative fields and by at least one uh, member from the industry as well as at least one member from the regulatory bodies. So they have been very well validated and they are reusable and they are consistent. Plus the fact that every time we have a uh, release in Medra, we go back and we check whether any of the new terms that were added in every Medra release should be included in any of the existing SMQs. So they are regularly maintained by the MSSO as well as the JMO um, medical teams. The limitations of the SMQ is that it's, 
it's not possible for them to cover every single medical topic of interest or every single uh, safety issue of interest. However, if you do come across um, areas of interest or medical topics that you think warrant the need for uh, a standardized medical query, please let us know. We do uh, uh, review those kind of uh, comments or suggestions and take them very seriously. Another limitation is that the SMQs at the time that they were built may not include absolutely everything because the more information that comes in as they're being used may lead to them being refined throughout their life cycles. So they may get um, more changes throughout their life cycles as they are used in development, which is another reason why it's always good to have a discussion about your versioning approach internally in your organization. All right, browser demo. So let me just show you how to get there. Let's start with how to get to the browser. So let me go back to our homepage. On our homepage, on the top right-hand corner, again, is our short links, uh, quick links. There's our web-based browser. But another way to get to the web-based browser before we get it from the uh, quick link is under how to use and the tools. So these are the Medra tools available. And like we said, your temporary credentials available to you today will allow you to test out our um, Medra tools. So if you're interested before the end of the week to test them out, please do so, or you can use your own company's username and password. But I'm gonna go through the um, quick link with the WBB. It allows me to select my interface language right off the bat. So if I don't want English, I can select any other language for my interface language as I'm familiar with or comfortable with, and I can log in here. So I'm gonna give you a very quick demo of the browser as it's used for coding, and then a demo of the browser as it's used for analysis. The layout is the same, no matter which view you're in. So as soon as you open up your Metro browser, there's uh, about uh, five panes in your in your browser. The one across the top, all the way across the top, the one in gray, this is your settings and your tools. So it defaults to whatever language you selected. It defaults to showing you uh, codes and showing you non-current LLTs. If I don't want to see numeric codes, I can um, ignore them. Well, at least that's my setting. My setting is defaulted uh, as such. And then it defaults to English, 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 and version 26. So you'll see that one of these languages has a different color. The color of the language that I select determines the order of the terms that I will see. So for example, if I choose my second language to be French, you start to see that the changes in the terms, my third language to be Italian, then I can see the three different languages, the order of which starts with English and then French and then Italian. And the order of my system organ classes will be based on the English alphabet. Having selected different languages here under language and version options will allow me to search for these three different languages. So I can search up terms in English or French or Italian. But if all I have is the English language selected here, then I can only search under that language. So whatever languages you're interested in, you can ch choose up to three at the same time. And you can select whichever version of Medra you're interested in. So those are the, the, the settings. It defaults to your system organ class view. So this is the view you use for your coding for SOC. And it defaults to your release. But I can see my supplemental terms. Once I click supplemental, everything turns pink. And pink is kind of like, be careful, what you're looking at right now has not been released yet, but you can still look at it. So I can take a look at my supplemental only in English. Once the English is released, then it's translated to the other languages. So my supplemental is only in English. Let me go back to my release. And these are my tools up here in the blue. So the Medra concept description is things you reference when you're coding. So we're not going to touch on it now. The legends will show you the different uh, color codes. I'll, I'll come to this in a little bit. I don't want to confuse you just now. The search history allows you to look up terms, individual terms, and trace them back through their uh, history, through their life cycle within Medra. You can open a new browser window if you want to experiment and uh, look up different terms under different 
conversions. So if I'm looking this up the same term here under 26, I can look it up here under 22.1 and in a separate uh, window. You can also uh, have a link right here to Mendo documentation. So if I want to reference something in my PTC documents or in my introductory guide, I don't have to exit the browser. I can link the documents straight from the browser. There's the user guide with all the details about using the browser if you're interested. And here are my tools. So here's my SMQ analysis tool and here's my hierarchy analysis tool. So we're not going to be touching the hierarchy analysis tool, but demos on that are included in that um, data analysis and uh, query building with Medra webinar. So uh, there's a lot of demos for this tool there, but we're going to be interested in the SMQ analysis tool. But before we go to it, I want to show you the rest of the panes. So that was my first pane, my um, settings and my tools. The second uh, pane or panel is my search options. So when I'm coding, if I'm in here to code, I'm able to look up any term that I want here within the, um, the, uh, the search area. I can do it in any language I want as long as I selected the language and I can put it as parts of words or as full words, whatever I'm comfortable with. Of course, if it's full words, it has to be correctly spelled. If it's parts of words, so if I put limb deform, limb deform like that, and if I click enter, it's going to pull up in the bottom here in the search result output panel or pane, it's going to pull up everything that has those two roots, that has limb and has deformity, and in any order that they exist in and in any level, because it's pre-selected to tell me whether those words exist as an LLT or PT or HLT, HLGT or SOC. So here under search results, these are my LLTs. So this is the one I'm interested in when I'm coding. These are my PTs. These are my HLTs. So even if the HLT has limb deformity, and you'll notice that there's no limb in here, it's just extremity, it's because it's using the synonym list. So it has built-in synonym list to make it a bit more uh, able to retrieve uh, uh, things that are relevant, even if you didn't use the exact word. So even though I didn't use limb, it has a synonym list to identify that the word extremity and limb are syn synonymous. So it's pulling that up for me. Okay, so these are, let me go back to my LLTs. These are my uh, search outputs. Anytime I click on any one of them, information opens up on my right-hand side. And this information is my term details for any, any term I click on, no matter what the level. So if I click on an HLT, it also has term details. And these term details will really tell me uh, a few things about the term that I'm on. If it's an LLT, what is the hierarchy? Uh, the PT, the HLT, the HLDT, and the SOC, and also if it's an LLT, whether or not it's current. So I have the information right here in my term details. Another way I can get the same information is by right-clicking and opening up details and occurrences. If I right-click and open details and occurrences, I'm getting the same information I got here, but in a printable format. I can easily print it if I want to. So that's my search result and my term detail. My last two panels here on the left are my hierarchy panels. So on the, on the left-hand side here are my 27 system organ classes arranged alphabetically based on my English alphabet. I can expand any of them I want to whatever level I want. But as I expand, if I pick a certain term, like I'm un, uh, interested in cardiovascular syphilis. So if I click one, you'll notice information showed up here on the top and information showed up here on the right. The information that showed up here on the right is my term details, just like when you clicked it here. It's my term details, all the information about my term. It's hierarchy, whether it's uh, related to one or more um, system organ classes and which one, the one with the box, with the blue box, that's the one that's the important one because that's the primary system organ class. That is the one that's going to show up in your, um, uh, typically the one that shows up in your data presentation uh, Excel sheets if you're presenting by your primary system organ class. But it also tells me if it has a secondary system organ class and what that secondary system organ class is. The information that shows on the top is what 
what is the term that I've clicked on when I'm in this hierarchy? Because if I start scrolling down and looking at other things, so for example, let me open up more information and start scrolling down, I no longer see the original term that I was on, but this box here reminds me without having to scroll back up that the term I was on was the cardiac disorders, specifically the cardiovascular syphilis. So that was the term that I was on. So this is a basic look at what the browser, um, the, the panels from the browser look like when you're in the defaulted system organ class view. And um, one thing just to, to kind of compare when I switched to the SMQ view, right here when I looked up limb and deform, I got 17 total hits. You'll see them here. So some of them are LLTs, 15 to be exact. One is a PT and one is an HLT. Those are my 17 hits. If I go to my SMQ view, I still have the same panels, the, the same five panels, the same ability to change languages, to change version, to uh, click to reach my Metro documentation, the same ability to um, pick the codes or not pick the codes, but it added my inactive PTs right, because now I'm in my SMQs, so it's allowing me to also retrieve my active or inactive PTs. So if I click on codes, I'm going to see my numeric identifiers right here. And in my hierarchy panel, instead of my 27 system organ classes, it's showing me my 110 SMQs listed alphabetically, again, in the language that I chose, which is English. I can do the same type of functionalities I just did when I was coding. I can look up a word, a uh, combination of a word, and let me click enter here. So I'm looking up limb deformity, but look at my total search results. I'm only getting six. I had 17 in my coding uh, panel, but I'm only getting six here. Why? It's because I'm in my S and Q um, part of my web-based browser. So any type of these LLTs that I'm clicking on must be linked to an SMQ. Those in my coding view, and let me take you back to my coding view just to show you the difference. So I'm back in my coding view. I looked up limb deformity and I picked one of my terms. Yes, I'm, I'm seeing the hierarchy in Metro. I'm seeing the, the way that it's linked to um, in this particular example, just one system organ class, one SOC, but I don't see any SMQs. Some of them do, some of them don't. But I'm, I'm going to see all of the, all of the, uh, the terms that exist in the web-based browser because I'm in my SOC view. Once I switch to my SMQ and I look up the same term, it's only showing me the ones that have an SMQ that are included in an SMQ. So if you're thinking of looking for terms of interest to build a custom query, this view is more useful to you because it will eliminate having to filter through any um, LLTs or PTs in Medra that are not linked to an SMQ, right? So this view is the one that would be more useful to you when you're deciding uh, which LLTs to include in your customized uh, search query. All right, I can also drill down with my, um, from my hierarchy panel and see my uh, terms that are included in every single one of these SMQs. So acute pancreatitis, here are my blue, blue hot flame terms. These are very, very indicative, highly indicative of acute pancreatitis. So if, if I'm interested in acute pancreatitis, I should be looking for anything that's blue, that's the hottest flame. Here are my, uh, red, my broad terms, and the ones that have a hierarchy, like the acute pancreatitis, will show you which group it belongs to. So these are my B broad terms, these are my C broad terms, and every one of these PTs, if I expand it, I can see the subordinate LLTs that belong under it. What if I'm interested to see this information in an Excel format? Is that possible? Well, if you right click, on your SMQ, so if you go to your SMQ and you right click on it, you can tell it, export this SMQ for me. I wanna see it as an Excel sheet. And it's gonna ask you, it's gonna pull up this, this box and ask you, do you want the inactive PTs in it, yes or no? So, okay, let's say yes and export. 
once you export, it's going to show up as an Excel sheet in your downloads that you're able to open, you're able to save, you're able to share with your team members, and you're able to use as your um, uh, starting point if this is the topic of interest that you want to look into. So this is my inactive, right? You see it highlighted, just it's, it's telling you, be careful, you selected to see inactive PTs, but don't use this PT when you're running the SMQ. It doesn't belong in this SMQ. It's no longer active in this SMQ. So if I filter here, data filter, it's pulling up my preferred terms. It's pulling up my numeric identifiers of those preferred terms and it's pulling up the level. So it's, even though it has subordinate LLTs, it didn't retrieve them, right? It's an SMQ, it's gonna be focused more on the PTs. The release packets that you receive with every release of Medra has an SMQ Excel sheet and that SMQ Excel sheet has everything, right? It has all the SMQs, it has all the PTs and our ASCII files have the PTs and the LLTs. So they're all available and provided to you. You don't need to worry about retrieving any LLTs per PT if that's what you're interested in. And under scope, this tells you, here are my narrow blue flame terms. These are the most significant uh, in terms of this particular area of interest. And here are my broad terms. So here are all my broad terms. And if I have a hierarchical, uh, sorry, a, an algorithmic SMQ like I do here in acute pancreatitis, it tells me which of these um, terms belong in my group B and which in my group C. And the definition of each group is in your introductory guide. So you can go back to that, look up acute pancreatitis, and it will tell you uh, what each of them represents. Some of the SMQs have a weighted approach. So you'll notice that the weights here are all zero. Um, I'll, I'll show you an example. There's only one SMQ in our entire list of SMQs that has a weighted approach. That's the SLE SMQ, the systemic lupus erythematosus. This column is for the status. So if I'm looking for all of them, let me just show you all of them to see that the status will show you active and inactive. And then additional details which Medra version this term was added in, which Medra version this term had a modification in. So all that level information is available to you. You can right click and export. So let me go back to our SMQs and let me show you an example of hierarchical SMQ. We said hepatic disorder has a lot of groupings. That's true. So if I extend the hepatic disorder SMQ, I'm not seeing yet PTs and LLTs. I'm not, I'm not seeing those red and blue uh, color codes. No, not yet, because I'm seeing another group of SMQs, subordinate SMQs that are in that hepatic disorder um, main category. So if I'm interested in just the congenital hepatic disorders and I click on that, then I start to see my blue hot flame terms and my red, you know, um, also of interest terms, but that, that are broad. So my narrow search terms and my broad search terms, I see them when I, when I extend it. Some of them may have subcategories of SMQs. So even though it's drug-related hepatic disorder, that group is really too large to manage as one single group, and it's being subdivided into subordinate SMQs like cholestasis and jaundice, of uh, uh, hepatic origin or drug-related hepatic disorders, severe events only, or if it's um, investigations or coagulation and bleeding disturbances. So whatever you're interested in, you can be more focused in your search. And any one of these subordinate SMQs, you can right-click and export, or you can go to the main parent and export, and you'll see all of them there. So let's export the main parents and see what that looks like. I don't want any inactive PTs. I'm just gonna look at that main parent. And when I open it up, it's allowing me to determine to what level of detail I wanna see everything. So if I pick uh, the, um, 
uh, the subordinates, SMQs, it's all here for me, right? So one, two, three, four, and five. So it's showing me not just the hepatic disorder, it's showing me all the uh, sub SMQs and the PTs related to those sub SMQs. So again, this information is available to you as well in our release packets. Okay, so let me go back here and show you our legends now. So we said when we are in our SMQs, we see PTs that are blue and PTs that are red. And some of them have boxes. So when you pull up the legends in your SMQ legend, you're gonna see that the PTs that are blue, they are your narrow scope. If you happen to see a blue PT with a box around it, don't use that PT because it's inactive. So boxes means they can't come out and play. Right, so if it's in a box, it's not going to come out and play, but it's still a, a valid PT. It's just it's not active, and when I say valid, I mean current. Right, so it's still in Medra. It's still a PT that is in Medra. It's just not used anymore for this particular SMQ. If you see PT in in red, that's your hot, but not your blue hot signal. So that's your hot signal, but not your blue hot signal, and that's your broad scope. And this is active, it doesn't have a box. If you see it in a red box, it can't come out to play, it's inactive. So it's still a PT in Medra. It used to be uh, in this SMQ at one point, but it's no longer active, so don't use it. The ones that have uh, alphabets underneath them, that means that they have categories. So you are looking at an algorithmic uh, SMQ. And then, of course, as you drill down further with each of these, you're going to see the LLTs, right? So LLTs are in purple. And um, again, with the sorry, with the legends, if the LLT also has a box around it, that that's mean in inactive. So I know it gets confusing once you come down to the last legends here. How come I see maybe double boxed? If it's double boxed with two layers of boxes around it, that means not only it's inactive, but also it's non-current. All right, so one of the things that I didn't show you in the SOC view is the legend for the SOC view. So if I open up, expand until I reach, maybe Cardiac will give me different colors. So let me look at this one. Okay, so the Cardiac will give me different colors. In the SOC view, Here's my legend for the SOC view. The, the preferred terms that have a blue box around them, so if you have a blue box, that's your blue ribbon preferred term. That, that is the preferred term that's going to be showing up as defaulted if you're displaying your data in the primary path. So that is your blue ribbon uh, winner of your um, possible linkages. It means that the preferred term you're looking at is under the system organ class that is primary to this preferred term. If you see green, green means go. So there is a primary preferred term, but this is not the one that's primary. So if I'm looking at Brugada syndrome and I click on the Brugada syndrome here in the term details on my right hand side, I see the blue box. The blue box is congenital. So even though, yes, this belongs under cardiac arrhythmias but it belongs there as a secondary link. So green means go. If you see a green box, that means that this particular preferred term under this system organ class um, has a primary system organ class. You gotta go looking for it. Red means stop. Red means stop. There is no other system organ class. This particular preferred term does not have any other links to any other system organ classes. So that's what the legend means. The legend means blue is a multi-axial preferred term and you are on the primary link. Green is a multi-axial preferred term and you are on the secondary link. And red means there is no multi-axial link for this particular preferred term. Um, more details on this, if you're interested, are in our earlier webinars. So if uh, you know what is Medra and how to code with Medra, we do touch base on multi-axiality in Medra. So let me go back to the SMQ. Any questions at this point? 
We have one question asking if you could just give a little more guidance on when you would use broad and when you would use narrow. Uh, that's such a good question. And I'm not gonna answer it right now because it's coming up in the slides to follow. But if I don't address it to your satisfaction, please ask me again after I present that. But very good question. All right, so how do we use SNQs? So before I answer your question, I just wanna show you how to run an SNQ analysis tool. And to run an SNQ analysis tool, you do need to be on the browser. We do offer three different browsers uh, as part of your subscription. They're all available to you. The web-based browser is the one we just demoed. The Medra desktop browser has all the same features as the web-based browser, but you can download it to your desktop and work offline. The challenge with the Medra desktop browser is that you download it, it's available to you, but it doesn't have data. So you have to retrieve whichever Medra data files that you're interested in, in whatever language, whatever version, and upload them to the desktop browser to be able to use it. And you also have to remember that every time we release a Metro version, you have to grab that new release and also upload it to your desktop browser. But the advantage is you can work offline. The mobile Medra browser is also available to you. It has limitations in some of the features. So for example, all of them uh, will require your ID and password. All of them enable you to view Medra socks and view uh, and search Medra socks and SMQs in any language that you're comfortable with, but only the web-based browser and the Medra desktop browser will uh, allow you the ability to export search results and use your research bin. I'm not gonna demo the research bin in this webinar, but the research bin is another thing that we do demo in the um, data analysis and uh, query building with Medra webinar. The supplemental view, remember that pink, that's only available in your web-based browser because that's the one that's most up-to-date. The desktop browser will not have anything that's not yet been released. Um, both browsers, the web-based and the desktop, will allow you to view primary and secondary link information, will allow you to upload your own data to run against SMQs, and the availability to perform Boolean advanced search options like NOT or OR. So how do you run SMQ? So we said SMQs are basically a, a, a list of preferred terms that are related to each other, and you're gonna use them to check against your own data. So if your data is stored as LLTs, you can use the SMQ analysis tool. If your data is stored as PTs, you can still use the data analysis tool. If you're interested to see both PTs and LLTs, they are available to you in our release packets in our ASCII files. And of course, once you run it, you're gonna get hits. And the tool allows you to decide whether you're looking for narrow search or broad search or the algorithmic search. And of course, the hierarchy, you can select whichever hierarchy you want. Like I showed you, you can select to run it against the entire thing or against a specific uh, subgroup of that SMQ. Before you run your own data against the, the SMQ analysis, you need to format an Excel sheet. And it's really a very simple, very basic Excel sheet. All it needs is four columns. Your first column is your row ID, which is really optional. So it's up to you if you have any identifiers of your data that you'd like to include in here, you can use them under row ID. Your second column is your Medra term. So it can be your Medra LLT if that's what your data is stored as. It can be your Medra PT if that's what your data is stored at. The third column is your numeric code. If you're analyzing in English, you don't need both of them. So either one of them will be sufficient. So if all your data exists as your um, LLTs, you don't need to, to, to put in the code. But if you do have the codes and you don't have the terms, that's also okay. If you're analyzing in a language other than English, then it becomes a bit more challenging because during the translation, you could have the same term in English being translated to the same thing um, uh, in a dif different language. So an example, anemia with an AE spelling and anemia with an E spelling, it's the same thing. How can you translate that with, this, with that level nuance in different languages? So if you're analyzing in a language other than English, you do need to either use your codes because the codes are uh, unique, right? They don't change. So the codes are unique or you need to use both uh, the term and the code. The last column, column D, is your subject or case identifier. 
That is required only if you're looking at algorithmic SMQs. But if you put it in, the, the tool will let you know, will use it, and will let you know which of your cases are, are uh, identified as hits. So it's really very, very simple, very basic. This is the, the data set that you use. In fact, all of our tools, when you use any of our Medro tools, you just need a simple, basic Excel similar to this one. OK, so let's get started. I'm going to show you an example. And I'm going to show you the differences between running it broad versus narrow. So let's go back. I'm in my SNQ view. I can be in my SOC view. It doesn't matter. Both views allow me the ability to use my SNQ analysis tool. So here on my gray ribbon all the way on the top or my gray panel all the way on the top is my SNQ analysis tool. When I click on that, the tool will tell me which of the languages are you interested in. I'm going to keep it English, but I can run it in a different language. It's going to ask me which version are you interested in and this is very important to remember that if you are running your data, you're uploading your data into this tool, this tool is looking at version 26. If your data is something other than 26, change your version to match. So if your data is in 21.1 or 25.1 or even older than that, just change the version to match your data. And then it defaults to narrow search because it wants you laser focused on that um, blue flame. It defaults to narrow. If you want to look at broad, then you select broad. If you want to look at algorithmic, you select algorithmic. You notice hierarchical SMQs are not in here because this is where the hierarchical SMQs are located. And the, the, the yellowish box here tells you that if you don't select an SMQ, the tool is going to compare your data to everything we have, all our level one SMQs, level two SMQs, level three, level four, level five. We're going to look through everything. But if you want to specify which ones you're interested in, just pick on the ones you want, click Control and scroll down, pick whichever ones you want. If you change your mind, you clear your selection and you, you go back to being defaulted. If you want to specify the hierarchical, the ones that can be expanded, I don't want all the biliary disorders. I just want the ones that are maybe biliary tract disorders. This is the one I want. So I can pick the hierarchical subgrouped SMQ that I'm interested in, or I can again clear my selection and default all. So for my demo, I'm going to default to all. I'm going to select my broad, right? And I'm going to import my data. When I go to my import my data, it's going to show me the same outline that I shared with you. These are the four columns that you need to include. Your row ID is optional. It's alphanumeric. Your second column should have your term, whether that's in the LLT level or the PT level. Your third column is your the column for your numeric code. And if you're Analyzing in English, it's not required. You can use either one. If you're analyzing in a language other than English, then please use the numeric code with or without the term. And your last column is your case ID. So if you have case IDs you're interested in, you plug them in here. It will use them if you plug them. It will ignore them if you don't use them. So either one of these columns, if you leave it blank, it's still going to work. But if you're looking for algorithmic SMQs, it's not going to work without a case ID. A few notes here that the, um, the version should be the same. We always stress that. Please remember the version of the data that you import should be the same as the version you're analyzing in. And uh, the tool will not store your data. So if you run a data and you um, don't uh, save it and export it and you want to retrieve it, you have to run it again. The tool will not store your data. The maximum for now is 11, is 100,000 rows that you can import. And you're assumed to be uploading data that has already been standardized to Medra terms. You're not importing data with verbatims. You're importing data that has already been standardized to existing Medra terms. When I click choose my file, I'm going to go to my demo. And this is my file. And before I open it up, let me show you my file. So here's my file. If I double click it, 
it has the same layout as the um, expected information, a row ID, a term, a code, and a case ID. And it's not that big. It's 33 rows. Some of these case IDs have um, more than one address event. So these are all address events coded to the preferred term level. Some of my case IDs have multiple events and some of them do not. But on, what I'm interested in is a signal. Do I have a, a signal here that something is going on that I need to investigate and see whether it's uh, causally related to my product or not? So I'm going to close my report because it won't run if my report is open. I'm going to go back to my tool and this is how far I got. So I pulled my, my data. Let me use my file. This is my data. And I'm going to click next. Now, if it's identified that everything is fine and my data was, uh, there was no um, misspellings or no codes that were not valid codes, it's going to give me an output. If for any reason there was something wrong or missing, under the last tab, under validation, it's going to tell me, by the way, the following row I couldn't identify it because maybe it's not a valid LLTPT or the following code doesn't seem like something I can identify. So if you make a mistake and you put in invalid data, it's going to tell you which rows it could not identify. So let me open my output. And let's just let it go through. Let me just double check that I was in fact running it. I'm going to rerun it just to make sure that I was on uh, broad. I want to rerun it. I want to show it to you first under under broad. Okay, and it's really very quick. It outputs the information really very quickly. All right, so this is the report. It opens up in my downloads area. I can save it. I can edit it. I can share it with colleagues uh, and I can filter it. So to use an SMQ tool, all you need to know to do is to filter in Excel. That's really all you need to know how to do. You don't need to be a programmer or a, um, an IT person to be able to run the SMQ reports. You just need to filter them because it will give you all the information in an Excel sheet, just like that. There's a lot of information here. So if I go back up and I highlight, let me just highlight all the rows. And I'm going to sort them and I want to sort them by my SMQ. So right away, you can start seeing signals in your data. So that all I did was I highlighted the rows and I sorted them by my column that had SMQ matched. That's all I did. And I'm starting to see signals. I'm starting to see all of these cases of the same SMQ. Another way you can do it is by filtering. So if you filter and you go to the first SMQ, I only see one. The second SMQ, I see or etc. So you can filter or you can sort. So I'm just sorting. I'm just sorting Excel and I'm looking at my signals. So look at these. All of these are acute, not these. These are my acute pancreatitis. Are all of these significant for my medical team to look at? Is, is this something I need to be concerned with or not? So when I look at the category, I see that this has B and C. So I know it's algorithmic, right? which means that some of them may be way too lukewarm to be significant, like this one perhaps, abdominal pain. It's a category C. It's way too lukewarm of a, of a signal to be significant to me unless that same subject has something else besides the abdominal pain. But right now I, I'm in my broad view. My broad view is really helpful when I want to have a, a kind of an overall look at my data. I want to see everything. I want to see if I find areas that I might be interested to pursue further. So just seeing this for acute pancreatitis, that's a significant condition, right? Acute pancreatitis. So maybe I should run the algorithmic and identify the relevant cases and share that with my medical team. I don't have a lot of acute renal failure, but look at this. I'm seeing anaphylactic reactions, anaphylact anaphylactoid shock conditions. Maybe I should take a closer look here and in my category, I also see B and C and D. So that's another algorithmic SMQ. So now I'm starting to think, 
okay, to get a clear idea of these signals, I should run the algorithmic SMQ. Maybe I'll run that uh, next, right? As I scroll down, I see another other groupings. Here's another group of similar SMQs. What is this one? It's drug reaction with isonophilia and um, a systemic symptom syndrome, right? And they're all B. So just looking at B means that none of them are that blue hottest signal. They're all broad. So I don't have uh, narrow terms coming out from, from this particular SMQ. And as you scroll down, you see the same idea. So it gives you an idea of where your signals are starting to form in your data. Are you hitting any of the SMQs with numbers that may be significant to you? Now, this particular output, it will show, show you the information that you gave it. So it will show you your case ID right here. It will show you your row ID right here. So if you want to filter by a specific su subject, <coughs> excuse me, and see how many SMQs that one subject hit on, you can do that, right? So you can do that if, if that's your, your, your interest. If you're interested in a particular row to see if that particular row, whatever your identifier for that row was, how many SMQs it hit on, you can do that as well. <laughs> or you can run your narrow search. So you, another way to um, focus more on your output is, how would this look different if I ran it in my narrow search? So let me go back and run it again, and this time run it in my narrow search. So there's my tool. I'm going to keep it defaulted for everything. I'm going to keep it defaulted to English and version 26, and keep it at this time defaulted to narrow, and pick my file. So the same file, and click Next, and it will open it up as an Excel sheet and enable me to see it. My first output had over 90 rows. This output is smaller than that. It's, it's 48, maybe less than that, depending on the, the header rows up, up here. So it's 40 some rows. It's much smaller output than the, the, the broad. So this one is telling me which of the, SM, the SMQs found a hit only on the narrow search, meaning that if I had preferred terms that were coded in my database, but they only hit on an SMQ under the broad search, I'm not going to see it here. I'm only going to see the narrow search. But again, I can do the same thing. I can highlight, I can sort, I can filter, right? So I can sort, I can highlight, I can filter, I can pull up the SMQs that I'm interested in. I don't see that one with the isonophilia anymore because it's not in there. Th those hits were all broad. I even see an option here that says no match. No match meaning these preferred terms, they did not match to any of the SMQs in the narrow search criteria. So there were no matches. What about my uh, algorithmic? So again, back to my tool. I'm going to keep it defaulted with English and version 26, but this time I'm going to pick algorithmic search. I'm going to import my data, choose my file, same file, and run it next and see what I come up with. And again, a very quick output. This time, because I'm only looking at algorithmic, it's only looking at my data compared against the 10 algorithmic SMQs, and it's telling me I only found these. But the beauty of this algorithmic output is that it's telling me which cases are relevant. So this is going to be really useful for my medical team because this particular case, case one or subject one, seems of interest for acute pancreatitis because even though all they had is abdominal distension under category C, the same subject also has abnormal amylase under category B. So it's telling me, take a closer look at this subject. Maybe those two events have a temporal correlation, and that makes it highly likely that this subject is experiencing something to do with acute pancreatitis, and I need to identify if it's related to my product or not. Here's another uh, output for uh, algorithmic SMQs. My subject 11, only came out once under anaphylactic reaction, but it's significant because it's a narrow scope. 
So this is an important finding that they had an anaphylactic shock and they're under the narrow scope. But look at my subject 12. My case number 12, they hit on all of these broad searches because they had four adverse events and they, even though each one individually may not raise an alarm for anaphylactic re uh, uh, reaction, but the fact that they all happen together uh, for the same subject makes me really keen on taking a look at that subject and identifying, did these happen together? Is there a temporal relationship between these events? Is my product, um, uh, you know, a, a culprit in, in this situation or not? So this is where you want to look at your algorithmic uh, SMQs. So going back to my, to my screens, like we said, we first ran our search under the broad search category. It had the largest output because it looked over everything. And it included the narrow search as well as the hierarchical SMQs as well as the uh, broad search. So when I did my broad search and I let it default to all the SMQs in my tool, it was the largest output. The, the area where this can be useful for you this is where you may not yet know enough about your product and you want to take a look uh, across all SMQs and see if you find a signal. So if you're doing um, a safety analysis for something that you don't have really a clear um, safety picture or safety profile established for yet, you can use a broad, a broad view. The Algorithmic SMQ analysis was the, the most restricted because it only looked at my 10 algorithmic SMQs and only out of those identified the subjects that would be of interest either because they are blue flame, they're narrow, or if they have the broad search, that means that they met more than one adverse event in more than one category. So maybe they had signs and symptoms of the condition associated with some labs of that condition that will make them events of interest for me. Okay, so just to see, show you, um, let me go back to this one. I just wanna show you the systemic lupus because we said that's the only one that has a weighted approach. The systemic lupus is a, um, complicated condition. It has so many different uh, um, parts of the body that can be involved uh, and so many categories, subcategories that can be related to it. So when they designed the an SMQ to look for systemic lupus erythematosus, they found the easiest way was to introduce a weighted approach, meaning that the tool will identify cases of interest for you if the finding is narrow, Again, narrow, that means relevant, right? For all of them. Narrow is that blue flame term. It's relevant for all of them. Or it's gonna look for a combination of uh, events in different categories and add a numeric qualifier or numeric weight for each one of these categories. So category H, any term found in category H will carry a weight of three. But any uh, term in category F will carry a weight of one. If your same subject has terms for more than one category where the, the total count adds up to seven, that makes it a hit. So when I go back to my algorithmic, algorithmic output, here's my SMQ, right? So here's my SMQ output. It's identifying cases where the, um, the total numeric count, like for example, case 14, case 14 had hemolysis, which in the category for SLE carries a weight of three. The same subject, case 14, had autoimmune nephritis, which only carries a weight of one, so that's a total of four points, but they also happen to have a double-stranded DNA antibody positive um, event reported, and that carries a weight of three. And together, these three numeric weights add up to seven. So on its own, excuse me, the algorithmic SMQ was able to identify the subject 14 in your database is of crucial importance for you to look at when it comes to SLE because it's carrying a weight of seven or more. All right, so let's talk about SMQ applications. 
All right, where do you use your SMQs? Your SMQs can be used in your clinical trials. If your safety profile is not fully established, then you're better off using them screening in the broad search category. If you already have identified areas of interest, maybe in your preclinical data, or if your uh, product belongs to a, a class with known class effects in any of the uh, uh, SMQs that are established, maybe you want to run it against these selected SMQs. In your post-marketing approach, you can still use your SMQs and it will help you retrieve cases, either um, suspected or known safety issues. So you can continue with your review in your post-marketing uh, um, safety review, or you can, you can actually also use it as a signal detection because if you use multiple SMQs and take a look at them, it can help you identify new signals that maybe you didn't know about before in your post-marketing data because now you have a lot more information at your disposal. Another use for them, which not a lot of people use, is the single case alert. Let's say you're interested in a very, very significant um, uh, safety uh, area of concern and you want to know about them as soon as they they arrive, not at the time that you're doing your analysis. Yes, there is a way to do that. If you have an SMQ you're interested in, you always look at it, but you're always asking yourself, can I identify these cases in real time when they come in? Yes, if you can work with your own database builders or database programmers and use those uh, PTs and LLTs within that SMQ uh, to be programmed as single case alerts from your safety database, you can set it up that way. And of course, you can use them for periodic reporting, either as aggregate cases or for lack of efficacy. So lack of efficacy is a common uh, use for SMQs. I'm going to show you two real life examples for uh, or scenarios for SMQ analysis. So let's say that you, you work in a company and you're starting to develop a new drug. And the new drug is for onychomycosis. The, um, the prep team projected that this development will take about eight years and the overall cost is projected as $1.2 billion and you're in charge for benefit risk analysis. Maybe your first question is, well, what is my benefit and what is my risk? What is my, what is onychomycosis? So onychomycosis is toenail fungus. So toenail fungus is not a serious condition, meaning that when I'm looking at benefit risk analysis, I'm not going to be comfortable taking a lot of risk just to treat toenail fungus. So I start looking at my safety surveillance. I, I decide that I'm going to run SMQs periodically and I'm going to run them against AEs and I'm not going to limit my SMQs. I'm going to run them against the entire hierarchy of the SMQs. And I start finding cases when I reach my thousand patient exposures, I start finding cases that are indicative of hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic anemia is a very serious condition. So even though I only found five in my first thousand patient exposures, that's a risk that I don't think anybody would like to take just to treat toenail fungus, fungus right? So as part of my uh, uh, responsibility for the risk benefits, uh, ratio analysis, I decide this is unfavorable uh, ratio and I decide that I'm going to provide a recommendation to my management team to stop this project. So my management team has a lot of different members from uh, across the functional areas. They review my findings and they, they also see those same five subjects of hemolytic anemia and they decide that yes, this is a risk that we don't want to pursue. Uh, any further. So we're stopping it and uh, luckily it happened early enough where uh, there's not a lot of sunk cost and we can uh, protect those patients. Job well done. My second scenario, you're developing the fourth drug in a therapeutic class. This particular therapeutic class is used for a serious condition, but the therapeutic class is known to have side effects involving high blood pressure and angioedema. But because they are used to treat a serious condition, we are willing to accept this as an acceptable risk. Now, I've developed the, the medication. We're in our early post-marketing stage, and we know that the, the class effect for this particular product is hypertension and angioedema. I have SMQs for hypertension and uh, angioedema, so I, I keep running my post-marketing data again and again on hypertension and angioedema. But I'm starting to find out that 
the more information and the more data I'm collecting, I'm not getting hits. I'm not getting hits against angioedema and hypertension, even though they are known class effects. So what does that tell me? That tell me that my product may be a safer alternative to what's out there on the market. And that's great news for the, for the subjects, and it's great news for my marketing team. So that's another congratulations and tap on the back. Customized searches, uh, I'm not gonna go into them in, in too many details. Uh, they are discussed in the uh, Medra uh, data analysis and uh, query building with Medra webinar. But the one thing that I do need to um, stress to you is that if you're using an SMQ and you change it for any reason, you're no longer using an SMQ. So if you change an SMQ, it's no longer standardized, it becomes modified. So it becomes known as, or you should uh, identify it as a modified Medra query based on an SMQ. Our recommendation always, always do not change SMQs because everybody else who works with you, whether from within the industry or within the regulatory bodies, they're using standardized uh, Medra queries, they're using SMQs. But if there's a good reason for you to have modified the SMQ, then please name it as an MMQ, as a modified Medra query. Please identify and document what changes you made. Please ensure that you keep maintaining those changes throughout the releases of Medra, because that will be your responsibility now that you're no longer using the standardized Medra query. And one example of an MMQ that is very regularly used is lack of efficacy, because the SMQ lack of efficacy is really very broad since it starts, it's trying to accommodate different um, product lines and different product types and different indications. So the lack of efficacy does warrant being modified, but once you modify it, please maintain it. If you do modify uh, um, uh, standard, standardized measure queries into MMQs or create your own CMQs, customized Medra queries, you're always best served when you're having a, a representation from different departments because you do need folks with medical background, medical knowledge of the um, uh, areas of interest or the conditions of interest, also folks with knowledge of Medra and Medra structure, and also folks with knowledge of programming. So those are your cross-functional teams and working together is the best way to create your customized searches. You have your PTC document as a resource to you for construction tips and for the basis of creating your own organization-specific um, uh, guidelines, right? And please remember that you need to save this customized query so that you can reproduce it in the future. And you need to maintain it. Every time we have a release of Medra, you need to maintain it. If you created a customized search and you think it's helpful and maybe helpful to other, te uh, other um, users in the industry, please reach out to us. We're always willing to consider creating new SMQs. All right, so just to summarize, and then I'll open it up for Q&A, we went over the PTC guidance document. We discussed the characteristics of SMQs and their applications and how to customize them. If you're interested in more information, you can um, go to our medra.org website. The, um, there's a lot of information in there for you. There's uh, FAQs are really a helpful area if you have questions on Medra. There, those are the links to the um, Medra browsers our training schedule if you want to sign up for more webinars and our area has to reach the PTC documents or support documents. So with that, let me open it up for Q&A. I know that we're on the hour, so I'm willing to stay over if any folks have any questions. I am not seeing any more questions. We just got a confirmation from the first question that you did answer what they were asking about broad versus narrow. Oh, thank you so much for that for that response because it, I always wonder did it did it address their questions or not? All right, awesome. So you have all this information available to you. The webinar will be provided to you, so you can refer back to it um, uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, I do advise you to test them out. Um, the tools are easier than they look, right? Once you try it once or twice, it becomes so much easier. Um, and if you do try it and do come up with questions afterwards please reach out to our help desk and we're very happy to uh, assist you in any way we 